Hello and welcome to the Grand Touring Motorsports Podcast, Break, Fix, where we're always fixing to break into something motorsports related. When you hear the phrases Porsche and diesel in the same sentence, for some of you out there, you might be thinking Cayenne diesel, or maybe your mind jumps right to the diesel gate from recent years. And for most of us, our imaginations most likely move right to the sports cars. But what if I told you Porsche actually produced diesel tractors? Yep, I had no clue either. And if anyone at GTM knows about agricultural equipment, it's definitely the one and only Mountain Man Dan. So I welcome him tonight as my co-host as we speak with Sal Finelli, president of Porsche Diesel USA, to talk to us about the lesser known history of such a famous motorsports icon, the brand Porsche and their tractors. So welcome to Break Fix, Sal. Great to be here. Thank you very much for the invite. Absolutely. So, you know, there's this craze going on right now. A lot of petrol heads and their wives and significant others are all hooked on Jeremy Clarkson's Clarkson's farm, right? So suddenly farming is cool, but I think farming was cool a long time ago, but this lesser known Porsche history makes it even more exciting. So why don't we jump off with that? What is the history of Porsche diesel? So basically where it all starts is with Dr. Porsche back in the early mid thirties. He started developing what people refer to as the people's tractor, just like the Volkswagen, the people's car. So he started developing a tractor. As he progresses along, of course, you know, war is imminent and all of that. So he gets transitioned. You know, he's told by you know, his leadership, by Hitler, that, you know, you need to go do something else. So he started designing equipment for the German war machine. So the stuff like the tractor and all of that pretty much, you know, got set aside. So, of course, you know, we have World War II, it ends, and then at the end of the war, this is where it gets kind of interesting, there's now this drive, this requirement, if you want to call it that, to get Germany back up and running, you know, the farmers and all that stuff. So, Dr. Porsche wants to go into production with his tractor, but the agreement to end the war was that any facility that was building equipment for the German war machine could not reopen and make something else. Only people who were building farm equipment or cars or whatever were allowed to go back into production. So Dr. Porsche teamed up with a tractor company then called Elgeyer. So in 1950, they have an agreement. They begin production of what they call the Elgeyer Porsche tractors, or as we call them, AP. So he goes into production in 1950 for the sales year 1951, and, you know, off and running, they go. In fact, but in my workshop right now, I have one of the earliest APs on record that is still running. We have seen other serial numbers get recorded, but those people won't tell us if those tractors are running or not. But according to the America Porsche diesel registry, it is the oldest known running Porsche diesel tractor in the U.S., probably the world. So to clarify, mm-hmm. this is Dr. Porsche Sr., not Ferry Porsche, who designed the 911. This is Correct. Dr. Porsche who designed the Beetle. <laughs> yes, Beetle and, of course, the 356. You know, in Porsche fashion, every vehicle has a type number. So obviously the cars started with the 901. Everybody thinks it's the 911, but there's the 901 and obviously the 356. And you have all the other ones outside of that. So did the tractors have a type number as well? When Dr. Porsche worked with Elgeyer, again, you know, so their AP Elgeyer Porsches, they were AP. So the first one was an AP 16. It was then replaced or the subsequent one was the AP 17. And then there was the AP-22. So as the horsepower of the tractors increased, the type designation changed. You knew what the difference was. If you look at the AP-17 as an example, there was a Series 1 and a Series 2. And there are differences between them, and you can see them if you have both of them next to you. But really what it came down to is the first ones were relatively low on horsepower, 11 horsepower. But as we know, as, as diesel owners, it's not horsepower that we're worried about. We're worried about torque. And these things produce a tremendous amount of torque. So as the horsepower goes up, so does the torque. So the 17 was a much more powerful engine. And then when they went to the AP-22, 22 basically stood for 22 horsepower. In their terms, it was, it was a beast. It was a very, very popular tractor. Later in production, Elgeyer went backwards and created a one-cylinder 
which they call the P111. And I don't understand why they dropped the A designation, was it called a P111? But then in the two cylinder, and now, now we're talking about a three cylinder chart that they introduced, they used just the A. So it was an A122, an A133, then an A144. So the earlier designations are really confusing. And what I tell everybody, if you really want to learn, there's a book out there. This is what I consider to be the Bible. It's only in German. So you learn a little German. It's technical German. And a lot of the technical German words are the same in English. You can read it. But that book by um, Armin Bauer really gives you the details of the years that makes the models. So eventually, I don't really understand, but I think Elgeyer wanted to get out of the tractor business or maybe do something on their own. So the Porsche part of it was sold to another company, Mansman, okay? And they're the ones that began Porsche diesel tractor manufacturing in Lake Constance. And as soon as that transition took over, the AP designation was dropped and they just became P. So the first one was the P111. And the interesting thing is that the way Porsche did it, one was a designator for the number of cylinders. Then they came out with the P217, the 218, two cylinders. Then your three cylinders, you had the 308, the 318, the 319. So you began to understand how easy it was to figure out or how many cylinders your tractor had just by understanding the designation of the model numbers. So now there's there's no 901, there's no 902. <laughs> I kind of wish there was. Living in this world, yeah, I, I can talk to different nomenclatures all day long with people. I bought the business close to 10 years ago. It's almost becoming you know, my second life, just you know, living and breathing these things. Brings up another really great question. How long were Porsche diesel tractors made? How many were made? When did they come to the United States? You know, let's talk about some of that history. So we're talking about early production, 1950 for the 1951 model year. And I've never actually seen a number as to how many were produced by Elgai or Porsche. Now, in Mr. Bauer's book, he talks about approximate numbers. I just never got around to sitting down, writing all the type numbers out and how many he thought was made to figure that out. But now we fast forward to 1956, when the company was taken over, became Porsche Diesel with the dash. The dash is important. We'll explain that in a minute. So Porsche Dash Diesel is spun up 1956 for production 1957, and they produced tractors until 1963. In 1963, the owners of the company realized that at this point, there are so many tractor companies out there that they really want to continue to invest more modern designs and change things to fulfill a saturated marketplace that make business sense. They basically shut it down. So whatever parts were left over in 1963, they continued production in 1964 for a while until they finally ran out of parts you know, and shut the doors. In that time frame, according to the books and the publications, about 125,000 tractors were manufactured. So you know, mostly Europe, up into the UK, Australia, they were sent out to. There was a certain type of tractor that was sent down to Brazil with others. But of those 125,000, approximately 1,000 tractors were imported into the U.S. through the American Porsche Diesel Corporation, which was originally based out of an office building in New York City, but then they moved the entire operation to Pennsylvania. So tractors were imported by the American Porsche Diesel Corporation into Pennsylvania, and then from there, they were sent to their distributors. What a lot of people don't understand or don't know is that the American Porsche Diesel Corporation also imported them into the West Coast via a single dealer distributor that received the tractors, a company called Viking Equipment. They received Porsche diesel tractors and distributed them through Northern California, Oregon, uh, Washington State. Canada had its own import way. I don't really know much about or how many tractors came into Canada. You mentioned the fact of how they initially were AP and then they transitioned who was manufacturing them. Were there issues with the older ones getting parts or were the, did the individuals took up manufacturing the newer version continue to make parts for the older ones? So German law states that anything that you make that's in production or concurrent production 
the company has to continue to supply parts for a minimum of 10 years. So the interesting thing about the engine itself, excuse me, the engine and transmission were pretty much identical until the end. What, what changed was bore and strokes. You actually could take one of the older ones and put larger pistons on it if you wanted to. So you could go from a 90 millimeter, say, to a 95, a 95 to a 98, if you understood the books and knew you know, the right combinations. Now, the one thing I did learn when Porsche early on went from a 95 to a 98 millimeter system, the cranks really weren't strong enough. So those series tractors quickly went by the wayside. And that's why Porsche changed the center number. Talk about a three-cylinder. So you got a three-cylinder truck that's called a 308. Three-cylinder, all three cylinders are the same, 95 millimeter piston. Then it was a 309, bigger horsepower, more torque. It had a 98 millimeter piston, but it used the same wrist pin. So they were not reliable. What Porsche did after that is they changed that middle designation to a one. So instead of a 308, it became a 318, a 319, a 328, a 329, because they reinforced all of that. There were many, not many, but there was a series of tractors brought into the U.S. It was a four-cylinder called a 408. According to the books, there are about 25 of them that were brought in. I pretty much know there are about 14 or 15 of them are. They all have broken crankshafts. It'd be one of those that it'd be really great if I could collect them all. But the cheapest price I could get on duplicating a crankshaft is somewhere between seven and $8,000. Good night. So is it worth it? Yeah, you know, I mean, those tractors, for the people who are really collecting tractors and want to have one of every size, then it might be worth it. But this is a small business, so it'd be just too much of a gamble for me. With Porsche, did they have like a color scheme, you know, such as the notorious John Deere? <laughs> yeah, actually, it's true. Elgai are slightly different. So they're Elgai or Porsches. I've seen them in silver. Generally, you see Elgai tractors in what they call signal orange which is a very, very bright orange. You know, the body, the chassis, the fenders and that. And then they did the seat and the rims in what they call tomato red. So you have an orange tractor with tomato red rims, or you had a green tractor with tomato red rims. And from what I understand, the ones that were painted green because they were supposed to stay within the EU, European Union. The ones that were orange were the so-called export tractors. So in the US, you'll see several... Elgar Porsches that were brought in that were actually the signal orange. This 1951 I was telling you guys about earlier, it's silver, it's orange, it's green. It's got all sorts of different colors on it. <laughs> uh, we thought somebody had done that, but when you look at it, it's actually the company kind of put it together. So the owner recognizes the fact that the way Elgar did it, it should be signal orange. So I'm in the process of making sure this tractor comes out signal orange with tomato red rims. Now, when it comes to Porsche, Porsche in 1956 settled on two colors, primarily the red. A lot of people think it's guardsman red, but it's not. Not sure if you guys are familiar, but over the EU, they have colors that they refer to as RALs. I'm not sure what RAL stands for, but it's a color chip that is recognized all over the world. Porsche adopted RAL3002, and depending on where you go, generally it's called carmine red. It has a more orange tint to it. I don't want to say it's orange. When you look at it compared to Guardsman red that we're all familiar with, you can see there's a bit more orange in it. Okay, and that was the standard Porsche color until the end. Now, when it comes to the rims, the rims were paid in the RAL color, and the number is 1014, 1014. And depending on what website you read, it's either called creamy yellow or mimosa. I say creamy yellow because I feel like an idiot every time I say mimosa. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not getting drunk before I get in my truck to drink a mimosa. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's creamy yellow. So something interesting happened. And I've had this discussion with people about what the color of the rim should be. And this is where it gets a little confusing. The America Porsche Diesel Corporation quickly realized that if they brought a tractor into the U.S. that wasn't finished, that it was a parts tractor or unfinished. The duties and fees were greatly reduced. So the tractors would come into the port and they would order rims and tires from somebody, which I've never been able to figure out who. They'd show up at the port and put them on. Most of the time, they showed up with rims that were painted creamy yellow. But toward the end, 
all the rims came in that primer greenish type color. And I can't remember what it's called, but I think you know what I'm talking about. So they would show up in that zinc chromate type color. And everybody said, that's the factory color. I disagree with them. I think it's just that whoever America Force Ideas was ordering their, their rims from, probably either it wasn't on their purchase order, they didn't get the memo, whatever, but they showed up with these zinc chromate colored rims. It's not wrong, but in my book, it's not really right either. So with all my customers, I tell them the rolling chassis should be carmine red, 3002. The rims should be creamy yellow, 1014. This is the funny one. When you get to the seat, the top of the seat's creamy yellow, the bottom of it is red, but not all the time. Depending on the tractor that you get, I would say 90% of the tractors I have received here are the two colors, but I've had quite a few that were the seats all red or the seats all creamy yellow. And that causes not really confusion, but if a customer calls and they want that emblem or that decal that goes on the back of the seat, I ask them, what color are you painting your seat? Because I'm either going to send you, if it's an older tractor, um, you're going to get a, a tan one. If it's a true export tractor, later on, they came out with a sticker that was kind of a bright yellow. And then for the tractors that came in with all creamy yellow seats, you had a red decal on there. So I get real specific about what my customers have to make sure that they're putting their tractors back together as authentic as, as possible. It sounds like the primary market was the EU with a 10% export, let's just call it that, to the United States and probably to Australia. So a majority of them are in Europe. And then I'm sure most of them have made their way over here via the gray market and other mechanisms, right, for collectors yeah. and, and things like that. But, you know, it kind of got right. me thinking, I was doing a little bit of mental gymnastics. And in my limited research on the Porsche tractors, I, was, I saw that the average going price for one of these in 1950s dollars was about 3,600 bucks. So I was like, well, let me see what the conversion rate would be in today's dollars. And it comes out to round about $41,000 in today's money. So these things were yep. not cheap, especially in yep. post-war Europe. This brings us to a conversation about competition. Porsche was not the only game in town, right? And I think there's some really funny stories out there about Lamborghini and their tractors and Ferrari and his mm -hmm. Enzo and his tractors and whatnot. So how did that all play out? Who else was making tractors? Who was Porsche competing against? Let's go back for a second. So the price you quoted, the $3,600, that was for a three-cylinder tractor. What Porsche quickly figured out in the U.S., the market was either for the one-cylinder, the junior, which back then was about $1,800, or the three-cylinder, okay, like you said, at 3600 It was a tough sell because they were expensive for what they were. But it was hard to convince people that the price of those tractors, there were advantages. You got a diesel instead of a gas motor. You got something that's got a lot of torque. You know, a one-cylinder junior can do a whole hell of a lot more work than a two- or a three-cylinder kind of gas engine, you know, we'll, we'll say on a farmall cub. I'm not picking on cubs. I love them. I have a cub. <laughs> I think everybody has one. <laughs> but anyway, so you could do a lot more with a one-cylinder diesel. And when you get to the three-cylinders, those things are beasts. They're unbelievable. It's just the traction, you know, and, and the weight you could put on them. But the other advantage back then was that it was air-cold. So no water, all those parts you have to worry about, the fan belt, the water pumps, overheating, blowing gaskets, none of that went away. Porsche advertised it as turbo air-cooling. I always got a kick out of the name turbo air cooling, but when you look at the squirrel cage in the front, the way it was designed, you begin to understand, you know, the, the turbo flow. I honestly can tell you, like a three-cylinder, when it's running right and everything's clean and that fan's doing its thing, that tractor never gets up to operating temperature. So all these tractors had an air blade that you could throttle back, slow down that airflow. And if you look at the temperature gauge, it had a white zone, which meant it was too cold, a green zone, perfect operating temperature range, and a red zone. The smart farmer would sit there and adjust his air control flow valve and get that tractor running in the green zone for maximum horsepower output and torque. People had to be taught to do that. It wasn't just automatic like, you know, a typical thermostat on a car. You get up to 160, it opens and it controls itself from there. So to add on to what you were mentioning, the Farmall Cub as a comparison, being a gasoline engine, 
the Farmall Cub, I'm a little bit familiar with some Farmalls because I own a Super A myself. And okay, the, yeah. I grew up driving around on a Farmall Cub that my grandfather owned working in the fields and stuff. Farmall Cub was a four-cylinder gasoline engine, which if I recall mm-hmm. correctly, right. was around 13 horsepower, if that much. And yep, exactly. So you were saying that the single cylinder Porsche was roughly how, how many horsepower? So it was an early junior called the 111. That was 11 horsepower. But then the later one, the 108, which is the most popular one in the U.S., it was 14 horsepower. And then the later version, which was called the 109, was 15 horsepower. What they did is the flywheel, the clutch pack, and all of that kept getting heavier and heavier. I mean, when you look at a 109, I'd have to look at the books, but the flywheel and the clutch mechanism weighs probably 150 to 160 pounds. So you get that thing spinning up, boy, it's got a lot of torque behind it. The master that I'm working on, of course, it's a hydro drive. We'll get into that later. But that hydro drive mechanism, along with its doppelganger, the dual clutch, is over 200 pounds. So when I have to take it apart, I have to take it apart piece by piece by piece instead of one big chunk. Our listeners will be able to tell, like even though you were saying the, the lowest horsepower, the single cylinder one was 11 horsepower. The amount of torque the diesel's putting out was way more than a gasoline engine, especially back in the 50s. So for that tractor to put out less power, but easily double the torque of what one of the small farm alls would, I can see how that's a yeah. huge benefit to any farm. You know, this. there's a 108 that I, I got out of Canada. It's now sitting in a museum. The original owner bought the tractor, understood the whole diesel thing, but hated it because it was loud and it <laughs> vibrated too much. I got it. Okay. If you've got a properly tuned junior and you play with it and you slowly decrease it, you can get it to idle down around 375 to 400 RPM. Of course, you know, we're talking about a compression ignition engine. When that compression hits and it goes bang because of the rotation and all the mass, it almost lifts the left front tire off the ground. Wow. So this particular individual didn't like the tractor, didn't like the noise, the vibration. It sat for years. It's only got 10 hours on it. It's now wow. sitting in a, in a museum with probably 12 hours on it. That's amazing that you were saying the RPMs were only down around 400 RPM. That's a very low RPM. If you knew how to play with the governor, you know, and all that, you could do that. Generally, it takes a long time to learn how to do that. I mean, these tractors like to idle at around, you know, 5, 550. Max okay. RPM on any of them is 2,100. So oh, wow. they don't rev very high, but think about 2,100 RPM. And look at a master. They got 200 and some odd pounds swirling around. There's a lot of torque there. Competition back then, you know, I mean, there were a lot of different companies, you know, that competed. The one thing that I've talked about to people for years, Porsche diesel in Germany never understood. They couldn't figure out why they didn't get more traction in the U.S. And I told them basically there's there's three reasons. You know, it was the cost because of the cost of them compared to the other stuff we're talking about. All the hardware is all metric. I mean, you know, you don't go into true value or whatever and go get yourself an M8 by 1.25 volt. People look at you and you want to whack. There are stuff that's 516s in there. And then when you wanted parts, you had to write to the America Porsche Diesel Corporation at 808 Parker Street and wait for them to send you a quote. And then you sent them a check and then they sent you your parts. And for those of us in the farming business, like, you know, if your tractor's not running, you're not making money. I think that hurt them. But if you look at, you know, historically, and and you told me this story not long ago about, you know, Enzo and and Lamborghini, you know, going at it and the tractors and all that. But Lamborghini is still making tractors today, which is kind of surprising. Porsche is not. I don't think Ferrari is either. Although I hear rumors that Fiat and Case New Holland are are kind of (laughs) in bed together, right? So there's still some agricultural stuff going on there with the European makers, maybe not, you know, with their brand name right up front. So I think that's kind of interesting. Have you looked at some of maybe the Italian tractors that were at the same time? Are they better? Are they worse? Are they about the oh, yeah. same? There's a Lamborghini tractor out there. I think the model is called an R1. I'm not sure if Porsche designed their tractor to compete against that or vice versa. But that was pretty much competition if you're looking at a, at a one cylinder. In fact, I think the Jay Leno race was a Porsche Junior against a Lamborghini. Again, I think it's called an R1. I'm not sure. You know, and that's what that race was all about. But yeah, Lamborghini made very, very good tractors. I mean, most people don't know that Lamborghini made tractors before he made cars. It was his meeting with Enzo Ferrari that led him to making race cars. Okay, we'll get into that another story. You've got them, you've got Deutsche. I mean, there's, you know, there's a webpage I 
don't happen to have up, but it lists all the different tractor manufacturers back then and some of the designs and what they were doing. At that point, Porsche just said, hey, there, there's so much competition out there. And I think they just gave up. I mean, their next generation tractor of which I've heard different stories. There's either two or four of them that were made where they took one of the, the four cylinders and made it four wheel drive because they were the only company that didn't have a four wheel drive. Today, eh, you pretty much have to have a four wheel drive tractor. So that's actually a really great segue. And one point of clarification as we do this, you've kind of mentioned some things that I hear either came from the automotive manufacturing side of the business or maybe made its way into the automotive side of the house. So I guess my question is, you know, did any of their agricultural R&D apply to the cars and vice versa? And one of the things I heard was air cooling, right? Obviously famous for that with the Beetle, the flat engines, you know, leading all the way through the 911s up to the 90s, right? air cooling was Porsche's signature thing. So that's one, that four wheel drive system, you hear about the Audi Quattro that came from the Iltis, which was a World War II Jeep where they took that technology and put it into road cars. It seems like there's a lot of back and forth between agricultural, military and road vehicles. So how much Porsche technology went back and forth? When you look back, Dr. Porsche was designing a tractor and the engine was really, if you want to call it, it was modular. So you have a one-cylinder, which were the one-series. Then he had a two-cylinder, which were the twos, then the three-cylinder. All he did was stack cylinders on top of cylinders next to each other. Except for the crankcase and the crankshaft, everything else was identical. No matter what year, make, or model that you have, all the parts are interchangeable. So if you've got a tractor today, those cylinders are still made because they fit so many different tractors. Now, again, we're talking about air cooling. So what does he do? He just takes them, he stacks them, he orients the fins all the same way. There's this blower mechanism, it's over-designed. And what he does is the sheet metal shroud that cools them, he just stretches it and makes it longer and longer and longer for two, three, or four cylinders. All the parts to hold it on, they're all the same. All the nuts and bolts are all the same. It's just modular. And when you think about it, what was the Volkswagen? That's a modular engine, right? You have a problem with a cylinder, you take that cylinder off, you throw the crap away and get another one. And that, of course, you know, bled into the 356. So here's the really cool thing. And I tell people this and they think I'm nuts. Some of the parts in the one cylinder and the two cylinder tractors, you find the equivalents on the 356. Really? There's quite a few parts I've told people call me and go, hey, I'm looking for a whatever. And I'm like, Hey, you know, go to any of the 356 guys, and here's the part number that you buy. It's the same thing. Wow, look at that. Oh, yeah. Battery holds are the same. A lot of the connectors are the same. Some of the lights are the same. It's really kind of funny when you get into it that you see some of these similarities. I'm sure by doing that also after the war, because of coming out of, you know, lack of money, having it to where the parts could be interchanged helped them drastically get up off their feet and get things into production rather quickly compared to if everything was exactly. One. Good point. Yeah. Not only That's that, but I mean, it's it also goes to the cost of manufacturing. You know, oh, if yeah. you're gonna make a hundred thousand of something, the price goes down as compared to making a thousand of something. So yeah. you get that huge price break when the volume goes up. And once you set up the machines to do boring and the milling and the drilling and all of that, man, they, they start cranking out parts. So going back, you mentioned several times different models: the junior, the master, etc. So are those? more colloquial yeah. names for the different types, like the 308 and the 111 and things like that, or are they different sized tractors? It actually answers both. So a one cylinder is known as a junior. It's always been called the junior. So the difference is they had a junior that was a model 111, then they had a junior model 108, then they had a junior model 109. And then there were letter designators after that, that told you the way the tractor was configured from the factory you know, a V, a G, the special one that everybody wants is a 108S. The 108S was a junior, but it was narrowed. It's what they call the vineyard. So if you go up and down the vineyard rows without damaging the vines, there were 400 vineyards made between 1957 and 1960, 14 in the U.S. right now. I'm not sure how many were actually imported because we don't have all the records. So the ones that are in the country, I've got them all uh, recorded and tracked. Those are all originals that I know of, but there now are a couple that have come in, you know, from overseas. But the really cool thing about the Vineyard S for 1960, they only made 20 of them. So serial numbers ran from one 
through 400. So starting at serial number 381 and up, those were the 20 vineyards that were made in 1960. And in my personal collection, I happen to have serial number 381. I just got lucky and found it and bought it. So then we transition to the two cylinders. And they have always been known as the standard, the standard tractor. Don't know where they came from. They just call it standard. But the thing is, it was pretty much the standard model for Europe. Everybody wanted two cylinders. Two cylinders seemed to be the best combination for them over there. So we're talking about two cylinders, and we're talking about like 208. After that's the 217, 218, 219. So all of those, uh, all those two cylinders were called standards. Some were called standard stars. Some were called standard export. Specific configuration that they exported. Then from there, we go to the three cylinder, which was called a super. You know, you're starting to get into a bigger, heavier, much beefier tractor. Horsepower is going up, parks going way up, tires are getting a lot bigger. And I'll tell you, driving the three cylinder without front weights, yeah, you got to be really careful. It's got so much torque. That front end will come up on you. Pretty much every three cylinder I've ever seen always has either three or four optional weights on the front. Again, it's just called a super. Cool name. It's amazing how many people call me and go, they want to buy a super because of the name. They don't want a standard because, well, that's just a standard track. It's like, I don't want a standard car. I want, you know, I want the better version. And then, of course, you get to the four-cylinder, which is called the Master. The 408, 409, 418s, 419s, massive tractors, really heavy, lots of torque, lots of horsepower. You know, I wish you guys could be here to drive a Master. The one I currently have here, it's a Master. It's a four-cylinder. It's got 14.9-inch wide tires on the rim you know, on the rear, which is massive. And I tell everybody, when you fire that thing up, throw a little RPM to it, get up around a thousand RPM, put it in gear, let the clutch out. You don't move. It rotates the earth up underneath you. That's so <laughs> much and you got to experience it. You really have to experience it. I mean, you get on this thing, you fire it up and you're like, it's a beast. They were designed to pull what they call a six game plow have a customer who has a 318. So it's the same size as the master. The transmission's the same, wheels and tires, three cylinder instead of a four. He got a hold of me. He goes, hey, I think my clutch is slipping. Like, what do you mean your clutch is slipping? He goes, well, I let it out. It just doesn't seem to want to go anymore. So I went up, got on it, fired up, drove it around. So there's nothing wrong with this thing. And he's like, are you sure? I said, yeah, you have to understand. These are lower geared tractors. They're not going to be fast. They're not going to haul butt down the road at, you know, 20, 25 miles an hour. I said, but, you know, this thing will pull a six-game plow at 20 miles an hour all day long. You'll just never notice. It's just they're not designed to go fast. It's really funny. The speedometer is, of course, in kilometers per hour. So thinking about owning a vehicle back in the late 50s, early 60s, that the speedometer was in kilometers per hour, farmers would go, what? <laughs> when you got a tractor and the maximum speed on it is 40 kilometers per hour, well, we do the calculation, that's 24 miles an hour. They that being pull. said, a speedometer on a tractor is not a very common thing. So any of the older ones I've been around, I've never seen a speedo one. So that's very interesting they came with that. Well, th th hey. This is a Porsche. You expect a cut above everything else. You know, we, we speak about this with cars all the time for the badging. And you were saying everybody wants to buy a super instead of a standard. It's good to see that happens in the tractor world as well. Yeah. I would like a uh, Porsche diesel turbo S. Thank you very much. Right? <laughs> Which actually is a great segue cool. as we dive deeper into this technical part of the conversation. I guess my question, you know, in hearing all this, and it's actually really cool, you know, different size tractors, motors, power output, and all that kind of stuff. Were they always naturally aspirated or did they venture into turbocharging? And I bring that up because... Porsche Senior is famous for being involved in the Mercedes SSK build, which was one of the early supercharged right. Mercedes, right? So I'm wondering yeah. if some of that technology made its way into the tractors. None that I know of. I'm, a, I'm, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the famous tractor race at the last run sport. Kind of scary. They wanted me to go out there. I just refused because personally, I didn't think it was a, a controlled event. Um, so you saw people out there trying to drive tractors, and you probably heard all the gear grinds and stuff like that. Well, you know what? These don't have synchro transmissions. Nobody really understood how to really drive those tractors because, from what I understand, it wasn't until the owners got there that they were told, oh, you can't drive your tractor. A professional driver has to drive your tractor. Well, you know what? When you find that out, you begin to understand why Patrick Long won. He's a professional driver. He's got a Porsche diesel tractor. He got parts for me, you know, <laughs> and he won because he understood the tractor, okay? 
And it's not as if the junior is the fastest thing out there. He just knew how to drive it. Um, and I can honestly tell you from that tractor race, I have sent clutches and shift forks and all sorts of parts to about eight different tractors so the guys could get their tractors back up and running again. The reason why I bring this up is that it's some of the juniors came with, but, but the two, three, and four cylinders came with, which was revolutionary back then, a hydro clutch. Think about that for a second. It's a hydro clutch. Today, we kind of call it a torque converter. So here you have Dr. Porsche designing this hydraulic coupler. Crankshaft's turning this big-ass flywheel. Attached to the flywheel is an impeller. Separate from that, there's another impeller attached to your clutch. So these parts are spinning in fluid. So it's got to spin and create fluid pressure to drive the other side. That, in turn, drives your clutch. So if you really know how to drive one of these tractors, again, we have to go back. They do not have synchro transmission. You do not shift on the fly. You take your tractor, you put in whatever gear you want. You let the clutch out. It's not going to stall. The engine will finally build up enough torque through fluid pressure and start driving the other side, and off you go. So if there was anybody in that tractor race that understood that, I would have got on that tractor, gone wide open, put it in fourth gear, and let the clutch out and just hauled butt down to the track. But these people are trying to leave in first gear and shift to second and shift to third. You know, you hear was gear grinding. And I mean, I, I sat there when I watched the video. I was like, oh, God, I don't want to hear this. So, you know, of course, you know, Patrick Long, he's got a 108 that doesn't have a hydro mechanism in it. So he just puts it in fourth gear and throttles it, you know, and off he's gone. So that is one of the really kind of the innovative things that was going on was that hydrostatic coupler that he created, which made a huge difference because you could start out in any gear you wanted. I don't know if it still goes on, but there's a competition in California every year as to who has the slowest tractor. So guys show up, they throttle, where are you going to laugh? They throttle their tractors down, they put in gear and they let it out and they measure it. Uh, yeah, yours is going like, you know, one and a half miles an hour. There's an option for all the Porsche diesel tractors, but basically it lowers the gear ratio even more. So you take your tractor, you go out there in first gear. I take that back. You don't go out first, you're out in fourth gear. So you get maximum slippage. You put it in fourth gear, creep, it's called the creeper gear. You put the creeper gear in it, you throttle it down, and you let the clutch out. There's not enough RPM to really build up enough pressure to get this thing to move forward since it's in fourth gear. <laughs> but it will finally start to move. And it crawls along at about a quarter of a mile an hour. Oh, my God. And one you of my customers faster, does it. He's got all these trophies. He does the same thing every year. I just laugh. He's, he figured it out. You mentioned the hydrocoupler. Did they experiment with any, like, hydrostatic transmissions that were starting to be innovated at that time? Are they all just manual or the no, hydro? Not that I'm aware of. They had that. And, of course, they had a separate hydraulic system for, you know, your three-point hitch. And what was nice about the hydraulic system is there were ports in different places if you wanted to tap off to it to run another hydraulic mechanism for your planter, your cedar, you know, whatever those things that are labeled behind you. Did Porsche themselves manufacture a lot of the implements for them, or did they have third-party companies that people would buy them from? They had, yeah, they had third-party companies do that. Okay. I don't know who the companies were over in the EU, but in the U.S., they teamed up with a company called F&W. And the gentleman's name, his, his last name was Funk, and the other gentleman's last name, W, I believe it was Williams, Williamson. You could order a Porsche diesel tractor, and if you wanted a bucket, a backhoe or something like that, Porsche would get it to H&W, which was in Connecticut, and they would configure it with your bucket, whatever you wanted on it, and then transport it to whoever the, the buyer was. But now, FNW was the only authorized company to do that. For the hydraulic systems they had, was it all hydraulic fluid or did they use any sort of pneumatic systems like some of the old farm malls did? It was all hydraulic fluid. The way the systems were designed, pump up in the front, and you could change the pump 5 liter, 10 liter, or 20 liter per minute, I think, but depending on what you were doing, if you needed more flow, two screws, take it off, pop the new one in place, exact same hose connections, and you went from a, a 10 liter to a you know 20 liter per minute pump. And then you mentioned for like some of the attachments, most of the Porsche tractors most commonly with like two point or three point hitches on the rear. Three point hitch for everything. Yeah. Yeah. I know during that time of the fifties, like a lot of the tractors then still had two points and the three point was the new thing at that time that was so much greater. Three point implement is so much better than a two point. It's, it's right. amazing. Much better control. Yeah. 
Yeah. The only thing that I know of that you could order from the factory to get delivered into the U.S. was a sickle bar mower. So okay. the factory over in Germany would attach a sickle bar mower for you before it got shipped to the U.S. Was the sickle bar mower that they would provide, was the one that sat on the back of the three-point or was the one that tied onto the side of the tractor? Side of the tractor ran off a pulley. So in other words, a center-mounted pulley. So all the tractors came with a shaft in the middle that you could mount a pulley on. So they didn't have to do like the farm models where you had to run off the PTO with all the pulleys drawn up underneath for a belly component? No, no. <laughs> Very nice. I was there buying one of those for mine. I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> It's, I mean, they did it, got it. That's really awesome. But I'm like, I really don't need this. So yeah. kind of the interesting thing about Porsches is that depending on your make and model, you know, the juniors had one PTO out the rear. The two cylinders had one out the rear, one in the middle. When you get to the three cylinders and the four cylinders, and some of them had two PTOs out the rear, one in the middle, and then one out the front. Interesting. So you could actually get a tractor with four PTO outlets, all individually controlled by, you know, levers and key positions. What style were they? Were they live PTOs? I mean, you mentioned they were individually controlled, but I was just curious what style PTOs they were, because I know there's like three or four different types. So the front PTO ran off the crankshaft. Whatever the engine RPM was, that was the RPM going out the front. The center mount PTO and the rear top PTO were driven off the clutch. So basically, when the clutch was out, they engaged. And then the other one in the rear was engine RPM all the time. So a lot of the engine RPM is it went straight off the back. It's amazing how different PTOs work and everything. Because I've got, other than my old farm all, which of course, if you want the PTO to run, you have to have the clutch out because that's a clutch PTO. More modern tractor, I have a newer tractor. It's a couple of years old. It's a Mahindra. Instead of just one to engage the PTO, it actually has its own clutch that doesn't run off the transmission. So I engage it to turn it on and then engage the clutch by hand for it to run to where I can have the clutch in uh -huh. moving and the yep. PTO works. So the, the later generation tractor, like I'm working on a 318 now, it's still, it's a double clutch. So when you let the clutch out, the initial bite is for the PTO. And that last bike is for the transmission to move it. So you always engage the PTO first before you move the tractor. Electronics on them. So like we mentioned for gauge wide, they came with a tack on them. What other sort of like gauges did they have as well as their charging system, stuff like that? Like were they 6 volt, 12 volt, 24 volt? So all the tractors were 12 volt. The early ones were two 6 volt batteries. And then eventually they went to a single 12 volt battery. Yes, and that's only because the availability of six volt batteries was more common over there as compared to 12. Don't really know, but you know, so they have two batteries that are nested together. So you open the cover, you slide out a tray, and there's your two batteries, you know, to service them. 90% of the tractors, that slide out tray is long gone, and everybody just puts a 12 volt battery in there, which I completely understand. So for some of my customers, they want authenticity. Boy, I play hell finding one of those trays. But I, I've got a lot of outlets around the world, a lot of individuals that I can go to and you know and find the parts that I need. Now, when it comes to gauges, they were very basic. You could get a tractor that had no gauges at all, except for it had a device that they call the four function control lamp. What you and I would refer to as idiot lights on a dashboard of a car, okay? One for oil pressure, one for your generator, make sure it was charging. There was another one that would illuminate when you got low on fuel. And then the fourth one, it was wired differently. Sometimes it illuminated when you had your high beams on. Other times it was a blinker because the EU is, when they make a, a safety change, they don't care if you've got a 2021 tractor or a 1954 tractor on the road, you have to go and update it. So that fourth bulb, a lot of times was used to indicate that you had a directional light on someplace. So that was the basic dashboard. The next thing is pretty much everybody was smart. They put an engine temperature gauge in it. Standard mechanical temperature gauge, you know, the pitot tube type, screws into the head, monitors the head temperature. You know, that's cool. Then from there, on some tractors, have a speedometer with the odometer on it. So you know how fast you were going and how many kilometers you put on your tractor. Kind of cool. There is another option for an hour meter. See how many hours were on your tractor. What I've learned from my diesel tractor is it's more about how many hours you've got on it 
when you do for service, not how far you've driven it. Definitely. Okay, so like that, the bigger tractors, like the four cylinder, you could actually drill a hole and put a clock on it if you want to know what time of the day it was. Right in the center of the dashboard, when you look at a, a picture of one, you'll see this chrome cover. It'll look like a pepper shaker. Okay. And that's your glow indicator. So before you start the tractor, right, you put the key in, you initiate a switch and you look through the pepper shaker and in there there's a wire as that wire changes color as it gets brighter and brighter orange that tells you how hot your glow plug is so once it starts to glow orange you wait a few extra seconds and you pull the starter so your fuel's getting injected on that and helps the tractor start. There's an interesting thing about this. It's got a really, really cool feature. So this glow indicator, you put in the dashboard, and it's got, I think it's an inch and a sixteenth nut that tightens it down. And then the chrome cap comes off separately. And I thought for the longest time, why did they do that? So what you're telling yeah. me, Sal, is they had a built-in cigarette lighter on this thing. Bingo. Exactly. So you could take the cap off, and when it glowed, you could stick your cigarette in there and light it. I haven't told myself, like, oh, this can't be. I came across a tractor once, and I pulled the cap off and looked down inside, and there were cigarette ashes in it. I'm like, I'll be damned. There you yeah. go. Yeah, and then next to the cigarette lighter, they had a power outlet, which today we would call a cigarette lighter plug, but it was a completely different size, so that you could pull power to run, I don't know what that, probably, you know, a work lighter or something like that. All those gauges, knob switches were all very common. In many cases, when we're talking about Bosch, we're talking about Hella. They still make the exact ones today. So when somebody wants to restore their tractor, the authenticity, once I know the year make and model, I know what horn they're supposed to have, what kind of switches they should have. You know, what is your temperature gauge supposed to look like? So you can do all of this. Speaking of the uh, glow plug thing, I'm familiar with what you're speaking of because some of the older military equipment that I ran when I was in the military had the same thing where you had to manually turn on the glow plug before you could start it. Wasn't familiar with that. They go out there and have the engine cranking over for 10 minutes straight with it not starting. You have to go be like, look, flip this switch to turn the glow plug on and they finally get it started. To your point, Sal, about parts availability still being a thing today, 60, 70 years later on, on some of these tractors. I mean, that's, that's awesome. And if you think about it, it's also probably due to the fact that they actually made quite a lot of these in a short amount of time. 125,000 tractors is not a small order by any stretch of the imagination, especially over no, slightly over a decade. So we talked about part scarcity before in sports cars where you're in low numbers. You know, they only built 1,500 of them. And even in the classic car world, it's really, really hard to get parts. But it almost seems like for the Porsche tractors, even though they're not as famous as a Farmall or an International or John Deere, like we're accustomed to here in the States, it's actually a pretty popular tractor in, in, in the reality of things. So this, is, this has been good, obviously, for business, and it's good for the longevity of the brand. It's actually really cool. And to your point, there's a lot of really, in very Porsche style, innovative features on a tractor that's 60 plus years old. Again, you know, we've talked about commonality of all these parts. Cylinders, pistons, all that stuff is available. Heads aren't. But I've got my own process where even if I get one that's cracked, I can save it and put it back together. So those aren't a problem. But here's a really interesting thing. If somebody calls and wants a wiring harness, I can get them a new NOS wiring harness. They go, what? I go, yeah. The reason why I say that is because the same gentleman that made them for Porsche diesel in Europe still makes them today. Now he has wow. turned the business over to his son, but you can call him. He has, you know, the boards. So you put the wire up to a certain length and you cut it off here. You do it. To me, it's a factory wiring harness. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I've, yeah. I've located the gentleman who used to cast the emblems. So the emblems that I sell people the, on the side come from the same gentleman. He's in his 80s. The gentleman that makes all the trim work still makes it today. He's in his 80s. It's kind of cool because I tell people, so why are you selling reproduction parts? I to me, if it comes from the exact same person and the same vendor, it's not reproduction. It's continuous production. Absolutely. Now, there are people out there that are selling, you know, repops, you know, as we call them. And I'm seeing some stuff coming from China. I've ordered some of these things just to look at them. And I kid you not, I, I got a switch in a few months ago. That was a copy of the Bosch switch. You know, obviously made in China. Got that thing. I stuck a key in it, started playing with it. Like I threw it in the garbage. Like I'll never sell something like this to my customers. It was half price, but you know what? They're not going to be happy with it. So Absolutely. in the garbage it went. 
I was gonna say, I heard you mention the generator on them for these tractors. Was it a standalone generator or was it a generator starter combination? Standalone generator. I, I had an old Minneapolis Mullen when I was younger that the generator and the starter were one component. Most people don't know is that if you take a generator and you put power across the field and all of that, it starts turning as a motor. So that's really how you check them. I get a tractor in, I'll pull it off. I'll do that quick little check and go, yep, it's good. I mean, most of the times I still pull them down, clean them, check the brushes, you know, do all that, stick it back together. But people are always saying, is it hard to get a generator? I actually, it's pretty easy. They go, you get it from Germany? Like, no, nah, just go down to your local Napa store and ask for a 12 volt generator for a 356. It's the same damn thing. Like some of the filters, it took me hours and hours and hours, but I researched the original size, the micron rating, the height, all of that for the original Porsche tractor. And I spent hours on the Wix site finding the equivalents to those, and I converted them to U.S. standards. So if somebody calls and says, hey, they need a fuel filter, well, you know what? Go down the app and tell them you need this part number, and you're good to go. Same thing with oil filters. So there's really no reason to bring them in from overseas. In fact, actually, the oil filters that I sell to people have better capacity than the factory and a lower micron level. What's being filtered What's going back in the engine is significantly cleaner than the factory filters. You know, that brings up a really good question, Sal, because we've just done some episodes recently about oil and oil analysis and things like that. We've had, you know, liquid molly on, we've had Mm -hmm. Blackstone on. And it brings up a good question because the oils that were used in the motors and a lot of the petroleum products 70 years ago are different than they are today. Leaded fuels. How are you evolving or modifying the tractors to deal with low sulfur diesels? And what type of motor oil are you running in these tractors in today's modern times? When it comes to engine oil, do not use synthetic. Don't use a synthetic blend. I call it, I jokingly refer to it as dinosaur oil. Go get dinosaur oil. Ford, Motocraft. Ford has a phenomenal diesel oil that's old school. And what's nice about it when you do the research on it It has a higher level of zinc in it, which is what these tractors really want. Synthetic, all that stuff, you know, they're taking all the zinc out of it. So you want the older, again, I call it dinosaur oil. You know, you want that. The base Rotella works just fine. You know, multi-grade. These tractors are actually designed for straight 30. Yeah, you know, that's fine. You can, if you can find it, use it. But your standard out the door Rotella T, that's a 10W30. Go for it, you know, and don't worry about it. Hydraulic fluid, again, nothing special. Actually, these tractors, when it comes to hydraulic fluid, they were actually designed to either use a thicker hydraulic fluid or SAE 10. If you can find straight SAE 10, just use that. Now, when it comes to diesel, if you look at the original emblems that the American Porsche Diesel Corporation put on the fuel tanks, It says specifically that these engines were designed to run a number two fuel oil. What's number two? Home heating oil. Heating oil, yeah. If you get home heating oil, run it on that. And the reason why is because it's not that it has more additives in it, but the way it's processed, there's things that are left behind. They run great on them. If you do have to use pump diesel, see if you can find a station that has non-road use diesel. That's the way to go. I mean, that's, that's amazing. I mean, to keep these things going after so many years is just absolutely incredible. But I think Dan has yeah. some maybe other technical questions about the tractors. Earlier, you'd mentioned that Porsche created the narrow model for in the vineyards. I was curious if they yes. did farm all having like the high proper designs and things like that as well, or if that was like the one like off design that they built. I'm going to cover three different ones. So they made a vineyard model. And they made the vineyards in the one, two, and three cylinders. So the 309 that I mentioned I have here earlier, the 309 was made as a vineyard. So you've got this 98 millimeter monster motor in this somewhat lighter tractor, and it's really narrow. It's scary to drive because it's fast, and it's got that narrow motor base. And if you turn a little too quick, you're like, whoa, oh. So you have to back off. And again, it's a 98 millimeter, so it's a bear. So they did that. So they had a vineyard. Now, the three cylinders and the four cylinders, so the supers and the masters, you could order in what they call the high crop version. So you went from the standard tire size, I know basically back then was 26. You would go from a 26 to a 36 inch tall tire. So very, very tall tire, but narrow, not really wide. 
and your front rims, instead of being 16 inch, would go to 20 inch. This way the tractor would sit, you know, somewhat level. So yeah, they were called high crops. They had their own special fender configuration. Again, tall, narrow tires. There's one for sale right now, like for example, in California. I know where there's one in New York. There's not that many high crops around, but it's it's a really neat configuration. I mean, interesting thing about the high crop is if it's a factory high crop, it actually has like a little baby step ladder that comes off the side of it. So for sure, people like me, I got something to step on so I can get up in the tractor, get up there and drive it. But without that, it'd be like one of those running, leaping things for me, you know. But that leads me into the neatest tractor that they ever built. And it was called a P312. They only made 200 of them. They made them specifically for the coffee bean fields, the mountains, the coffee bean areas in South America. So they're all in Brazil, every one of them. Rare as hen's teeth. There's at least two or three in the U.S., you know, that I know of that have been professionally restored. It's a really neat tractor. You'd have to pull it up online, but it has this cowling that just continues along, you know, and sweeps over because they didn't want to damage the coffee bean plants. So it was designed to take the branches and kind of gently, you know, move them out of the side. A couple of interesting things about that tractor. So when you think of tractors, we think about the weight of a tractor. Is it 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 pounds? This coffee bean tractor had magnesium rims on it. Why they were keeping them light? I have no idea. It's got little funny 10-inch magnesium rims on it. Yeah, they look just like something that came out of the original Coopers. <laughs> I like mini Cooper rims. <laughs> or Austin Cooper, I should say. So it's, it's kind of funny. So you've got this big shroud. I mean, it's very artistically designed. I mean, you know, you, you kind of look at it and you go, gee, it's got, it kind of got the lines of a 356. And years ago, I was traveling over in the UK and we got an email from a lady over there that had purchased one of these and wanted me to go look at it, figure out what was there, what was missing and all that. I meet up with her husband and their son, you know, and we go out and we look at this tractor and there it is. It's pretty much all there. And I get on it. And what you quickly find out is that there are three tolls around for sale, but most of them, all that sheet metal is missing. So it's like, what do you do with it? I couldn't understand why until I got on the tractor and started it up. Again, right? We're talking air cool. All the heat from that engine blows right on your face. <laughs> it is horrible. No wonder they took the shrouds off with this thing. You had to get rid of the heat someplace. Of course. You know, so finding one that's all intact with all the pieces, you know, it's really amazing. But here's the cool feature about the 312. The engine came with a whole box of parts. And you could convert it from diesel to gasoline to kerosene to whatever the hell happened to have around that you could burn. Wow. It's like a tri-fuel. Yeah. I really haven't studied them all that much. But the way it was designed, you started it on gasoline because it only had like eight and a half to one compression ratio. And once it got up and running and hot, you could switch it over to diesel. It would continue to run. There's a model of Farmall that's very similar to that. I can't remember the model of it, but you started on gasoline and converted. You switch it over to diesel. Yeah, after. we're gasoline. talking the same thing. How does that work without a spark plug, though? I don't know. I, I've never researched them. Of course, you know, I keep telling my wife, I'm going to get on an airplane and go down and go buy one. But talk about one of the most dangerous things in the world you could ever do. Because everybody down there, they like to deal in cash. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to walk around with twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in my pocket to go buy one of these things. They don't even know where my body went, right? Anyway, I don't know. I just... <laughs> Well, you're mentioning how the 312 was multi-fuel. Were all of the other ones diesel, or did they also have some gasoline engines or experiment? Uh, everything diesel. Only the 312 was the multi-fuel one. So they never experimented with gasoline or anything else. You know, early on, I mean, you know, diesels weren't really well known back then. You know, people didn't really talk about diesel engines and, you know, like everything else, he was just out there to perfect it and make it work. Probably buddies with Rudolph Diesel, right? I mean, he's got to get, he's got to market his new engine somehow, right? If you think about it, the time somehow. period. Well, yeah. Not but exactly. it, it actually begs a, an interesting question that we didn't cover earlier. In Porsche fashion, right, kind of looking at those motors back then, this would have been a pushrod engine or was it an overhead cam? These are all pushrod engines. With the collapsible mm -hmm. tubes, just like on the flat fours? Yep, exactly. 
Oh, yeah, man. so the difference is instead of it being a collapsible tube, the way it's designed, the, the base of the tube has a long spring mm -hmm. with a hot washer and then a ceiling washer. So what you do is you kind of put it in place and they have a special tool that yep. compresses and holds it all together. You get it where you want it, you line it up, you make sure it's lined up, and then you just quickly pull this special tool out of the way, it pops in place. The first time I went to use it, I thought, what the hell is this? <laughs> I couldn't get it to seat in right and all that. So I finally took some time, stepped back and looked at it and figured out how I read. This is how this really works. I've been using it the wrong way. And once I figured that all out and stuck it in there, I have never had one leak. Get another carryover, let's say from the Beetle and any of those flat fours, because all the way through the 914, the big block four cylinder, they use that same technology, right? Yeah. Interesting thing, you know, I said the company started here in the U.S. in 1956, and these special tools we're talking about, I have them all in my inventory, and I use them almost on a daily basis to work on customers' tractors. It's like the Schwaben tools for the modern Volkswagens. You got to have all this specialty stuff to work on these cars, you know? <laughs> you were talking earlier about the fact with the vineyard model, how it was kind of scary for the fact if you turn it, want to try to lean over. Porsche tractors, were they made as tricycle front end, or were they all wider front end uh, tractors? So no tricycle front ends at all. The junior... One of them came with a fixed width front end. The others all came with adjustable. And the reason why is you could take your back tires, you've got the center sections that would go this way or this way, and then you could take the tires and flip them. So you could have you know various different widths, and you could adjust the width of your front track to be the same as the rear. Two, threes, and fours all had adjustable front ends. Did they offer any dual rear wheel setup, or was all single rear wheel on those tractors? That's an interesting question. There is one photo out there where there's a junior vineyard with dual rear wheels. And I looked at that photo for the longest time, and I'm like, that's had to be special rims. Being an engineer, I pulled mine out and experimented with it. With the factory rims, you could actually take and, and put one hub on this way, put the other one on this way, and line it up, and it works. And the studs coming out of it are exactly the same. You surely went out and found another set of rims, and I'm currently creating a dually vineyard. That's awesome. Just because there's one out there, damn it, I want to have the other one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I assume when you're saying that it, the center hub of the wheel came out much like many of the older tractors did to where the center hub could come out to swap it to which direction and then the outer rim would actually yeah, bolt. Exactly. So that's exactly what it is. So you take the center, okay, that, you know, basically looks like this and you take one and you reverse it. The vineyard, they took and they reversed both of them but tuck it in as closely as could be. Well, then you take another one of those and you flip it this way. So now you've got this configuration then again, the rims, because of the location of the lug and where it is, because it's offset, you could put it on, you know, and, and change the stance of the tractor. So you take the inside flange, bolt it on this way, take the rim and put it on so it protrudes into the tractor. Then you do the opposite for the other side and you have this dual rear vineyard which That's I awesome. laugh at because I thought the configuration of the vineyard so it could be as narrow as possible. But again, these things have so much torque, you know, who knows what they're doing. So I decided I'm recreating that one. I went out and found a set of fenders for it. So it's going to have dual wheel rears and front fenders. That's nice. pretty cool. So yeah. a little hot rod. I'm hoping, to have, I'm hoping to have it done by Christmas. So let's yeah. transition into our third section where we talk a little bit more about how you came into this business, right? You've mentioned a couple of times, former engineer and things like that. So tell us about the origin here, how you got into it. And you've told me in passing, there's actually an interesting story about this is the legitimate Porsche Diesel USA. And so let's get into all that. Let's talk right. about the business. Again, so the folks overseas decided they wanted to try to sell Porsche diesel tractors in the U.S. In 1956, they create the American Porsche Diesel Corporation, originally out of New York City, you know, and then they moved it to Pennsylvania. They were in operation until about, I believe, about 1970, because although they went out of production in 64, they still had to continue to supply parts for the tractors that were out there. And then sometime, I don't know when, they shut their doors down. The last thing that they did is they went to all their dealers and distributors around the U.S., bought all the parts back. And they sat in the warehouse. You mentioned that they'd moved from New York to Pennsylvania. Where at in Pennsylvania were they at? It was 808 Carker Street, Eastern Pennsylvania. I was up that way a few months ago, and I wanted to go back to the original site. So I, 
pulled it up on Google Maps and did the map view. It's a parking lot. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> so the original portion of the Insel Corporation has been flattened. <laughs> oh, well, that's okay. Employee number one of the American Porsche Diesel Corporation, name is Roland. Roland's now out near Colorado Springs. He finds the parts. He buys them from, I don't know who the hell he bought them from. <laughs> he buys them, give them to him, whatever. And this is about 1990-ish. He starts selling parts to keep these tractors up and running or for the people who wanted to restore them to try to sell them, you know, parts to restore them. I'm out in Yuma, Arizona. I'm doing some work with the Marine Corps. And a friend of mine is taking me to see this World War II Jeep that he's restoring. And as we pull into the area where the Jeep is, about 40 acres, and there's just farm tractors all over the place. Well, the, the gentleman's primary business was repairing farm tractors, but then also restoring them which is kind of cool. Well, as we pull in, I just happen to glance off my left shoulder and I see this unique looking red tractor parked up underneath a tree with this interesting nose. I'm like, wow, what is that? So we're looking at the Jeep and his name was Bill. I happened to mention to Bill. I said, what's that red tractor up there? Oh, that's a Porsche tractor. I said, oh, very fun. He goes, oh, really? It's a Porsche diesel farm tractor. I went, Porsche never made farm tractors. He goes, oh yeah, they did. Go look at it. So I walked over and here's this junior. It's a 108. It's a G model, which means it came from the factory without any hydraulics on it. Well, I'll be damned. I look, it says made in Germany. It's got Porsche diesel on it. So I walk back. That's amazing. Is it for sale? No, it's my mom's. Oh, okay. Years go by. His dad passes away. Mom wants to reduce the inventory. This tractor goes up on the auction block and I bid on it. And one, it comes here. And that's when I find, and then it was called Porsche diesel. So I get a hold of Roland, tell him what I have. Give him the serial number. He validates that it's one of the original ones that came into the country. And I start buying parts from him to slowly do the restoration. He happens to mention to me in passing in 2009 that this is getting to be a lot more work than he thought. You know, he's getting at an age. You know, he really wanted to try to sell the business. He had mentioned it to people and they all talked, but nothing ever happened. So we got into this great conversation. Pretty quickly, got the inventory. I see the price and all that. I'm like, the hell with it. I'm buying Porsche diesel. My wife and I go out to Colorado. We do the inventory. We stick them all in a U-Haul and we drive back across country. And I set up Porsche diesel here. And we named it Porsche Dash Diesel USA LLC. The significance of the dash is because the name Porsche is controlled by Porsche. You can't use Porsche by itself. So by having Porsche Dash Diesel, I'm legal. I don't have to really worry about them. You know, they don't really give me any trouble anyway. So we started Porsche Diesel USA. Then happened to be talking to a friend of mine who's good friends with a lawyer who looks at trademark stuff. And I went, could you have him check and see what happened to the original company name, which was the America Porsche Diesel Corporation? And they checked. And when they shut down the operation, they vacated the name. It was never trademarked, never registered. So we have applied for that name. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so the paperwork's in. So as I understand it, it won't be long, and I can actually call myself the America Porsche Diesel Truck Corporation, just like they did in Eastern Pennsylvania back in the 60s. You mentioned at the top of the conversation, there was something important to remind you about, about the AP and the AP changing, and it has something to do oh, with the company yes, history. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for reminding me about that. So if you remember, in the early days, it was Elgar Porsche. Well, Porsche Diesel decided that there were a couple of model of tractors they wanted to keep that were the same as the Elgars. So the AP, they changed to mean aluminum Porsche. Oh. Because there were, there's a series of the, only the two cylinders or the crankcases made of aluminum instead of cast iron or cast steel. So whenever, yeah. So whenever somebody says, I have an AP, I go, do you have a, an Elgai or do you have an aluminum Porsche? You have to know because, so the differentiation is between up to 1956 and then 57 on out. Any of those tractors that they call the P218s are also known as an AP, which it means aluminum Porsche. Yeah. So I got to ask, did they let you join PCA with one of the many tractors that you have, or do you own a Porsche road car as well? So the answer is I own a Porsche road car. I own a 2016 GT4. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Okay. Yeah. It's something I've wanted for years. You know, I kept waiting for them to come out in 17, then 18, then 19. I'm like, 
okay, they're never going to reintroduce this car. So I started looking around for a used one, found one on one of the auction sites. I bought it really right because I submitted my bid and the auction site froze up. So all the other people were bidding on it. Their bids were never accepted. It's the only reason why I have the cars. I got really lucky. Anyway, the guy that owned it before me, we still keep in touch. He just bought a 2021 and the standard joke with him is like, okay, 2021. So in 2024, I'll call you so I can buy your used GT4, and, you know, and I'll sell mine. We just laugh about it. He's, he's a great guy. He's a he's a pilot for United, just a super guy. Been a, a member of uh, the Porsche Club for years because my original Porsche, I bought an 87 911 Targa. Nice. So it nice. wasn't until, you know, just recently when I got the GT4, because my membership had lapsed. And when I put in for it again, they agreed to let me keep my same Porsche Club number and all that. I can't think of her name right now, but the lady that runs the Porsche hospitality tents at the various races, for example, like VIR, she has asked me to bring a tractor to the next VIR. So I'm hoping that the master I'm working on is going to be done in time for that. It's October, you know, and I'll bring that down, show people, teach them about Porsche diesel, Porsche diesel tractors, you know, because what they do in the hospitality tent is they have presentations by different people, you know, 20 minutes, um, you know, in between races and stuff. And maybe she'll give me a spot to do a presentation on the tractors. I'd, I'd ask and wonder if your GT4 is Carmine Red with Mimosa colored wheels, you know, because we have to use these fancy terms, but. Uh... Racing yellow. It's racing <laughs> yellow. <laughs> I did my damnedest because I did not want a white or a black or a gray one. There you go. When you eliminate those three colors, you're down to red. There is a green one out there. There's a guy in Arizona that owns a Brewster green one, which is really kind of awesome because it's the same color that they use in the 356 for one year. I think it was like 1962 or something. Yeah. Up until one of those made. And there's been a few that have shown up that are red. But when this yellow one popped and it was in, in Staten Island in New York, I just got really lucky that I was able to buy it. Earlier in the conversation, we talked about what it would cost in today's dollars to buy a Porsche tractor. And obviously there's more yeah. in the country now than there was ever before. And I've heard many a time that the Porsche tractors are actually quite sought after as collector's items. In your opinion, as a professional and being at the kind of the top of this, what does the aftermarket look like for somebody that would want to get into a Porsche tractor? And what does it cost to you know, maybe restore one or in terms of like price to maintain and things like that? So why don't we unpack yeah. that a little bit? Well, also to add okay. that for someone who's looking to get into it, is there a particular model you would recommend over the others for someone to seek out? Good questions. When it comes to the tractors, most of your collectors want to buy juniors. And the reason why they're lightweight, they don't take up a lot of room, they're easy to maneuver. If you want to bring it someplace, you don't need a big trailer. Okay. And those are probably the most popular ones. And you see prices on those all over the map. Seen them as low as $5,000. I've seen them sell as high as $71,000. Only I'm bringing trailer with though. <laughs> Don't get me going on a $71,000 tractor. But anyway, an unrestored running Pantene tractor should be between eight and $10,000. That's about what they're worth. Some people will tell you they're worth more than that. Some people will tell you, no, it's not that much. But you have to look at the individual tractor. What's there? What's missing? What kind of damage is there? How well does the engine run? I've come across juniors, you know, for three and four thousand dollars. But the problem with those is that they've got four or five thousand dollars worth of parts that are missing. If you've got a damaged hood, if your hood can't be fixed, you're out of luck because you can't find the hood anywhere. Fender, somebody can probably duplicate hoods. Really, really difficult. All the engine parts available, electric, all the gauges we talked about, the wiring, all that stuff is there. So if you've got one that's running, you're talking at least five thousand dollars now. A junior restored depends on, you know, your make and model again, because some of them are very basic. A very basic restored tractor should go for probably 20. I say basic, I mean, another frills, no hydraulics, you know, and all that. And then you get into the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, as an example, a vineyard, a professionally restored concourse level vineyard is worth, you know, like $65,000. 
Because again, there's not that many of them, especially if you have like one of mine, which was a 1960. The later versions, the 109 vineyards, I've never seen one because again, there were only maybe 50 or 75 of those made. I'd have to pull up the Bible and get you the real number. <laughs> okay. That's why I have that book, you know, by my wayside all the time. So you know, if you were to find a decent running one cylinder truck or a junior, and buy it for in the eight to ten thousand, maybe eleven thousand dollar range. Depending on what you wanted to do with it, if you wanted a real true restoration, now to me a restoration is where you completely pull it apart, clean up everything, rebuild stuff as necessary, and replace the clutch and you put it back together. You're putting ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars in it. There are people out there that just do repaints. They leave the wiring harness alone. You know, they just throw some paint on it. They still look good. But to me, that's not really a restoration. Now, what I'm coming across now is something in between. They've done the homework and they've done the really, really good paint job on it. And they've gone through and they've done some work on the engine. And maybe it still has the original wiring harness, some other stuff. So I refer, I'm, I came up with a term, I call them repurposed. It's a repurposed tractor. It may or may not go out into the field. It may or may not be sitting in somebody's showroom. But all those repurposed tractors show up on the 4th of July at a parade someplace. And it's really cool to see. A lot of the folks that I'm working with, you know, my age or older, they just love taking them to parades. They just think it's really cool. The two cylinder tractors, I mean, they've gone up in value, but not as much as you would think. And I think the reason for that is the name. It's called the standard. And everybody thinks, well, it's just a standard. Yeah, it's just, it's a nomenclature thing. Then you get to the three cylinders. The real collectors are starting to get into the three cylinders because it's a super. You know, I've got a couple of guys I'm working with. They finally understand, you know, they're buying two cylinders. But the three cylinder tractors, you know, they're twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. Now, there's a tractor for sale right now. I'm not tipping this tractor, but... Here's an interesting one. Here's a tractor that Porsche Diesel sent to F&W to have a bucket loader and stuff like that put on it as a demonstrator, which they did, and they demonstrated the tractor. Never been sold. So it's still on my records as an unsold tractor. So I tell everybody who's called me about it, it's like, hey, if you're interested in that tractor and you buy it, F&W will give you a sales receipt, and I will write you a receipt to prove that that tractor was never sold to anybody. Think of that. That's a 60-some-odd-year-old tractor that's never been sold, still on the American Porsche Deals of Registry as an unsold tractor. <laughs> I think that sets the record for Brad's lost and found on the drive through of the oldest thing that you can still buy new off a dealer lot. <laughs> that is, this is it. That tractor is currently sitting right here. So it's, got, it's got some leaks. I'm, I'm returning the leaks for it. So I, I tell people, it's like, It'll be sold to you and you will be the original owner, factory certified. That's awesome. Because the one thing that's nice about having the American Force of Diesel Corporation, I've got the listings of all the serial numbers of the tractors that came into the U.S. And you know how Porsche Cars North America will give you a, well, they used to call it a certificate of authenticity and they keep changing the name. I can do that now for your tractor. I just finished tracing one that came from Europe, got shipped to the West Coast, was sold from the West Coast distributor. I found the original receipt to the original owner who never sold a tractor. His son's restoring it. So I'm putting together a letter for him that says, this is when it was made. This is when it was shipped. Boom, 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 boom. You're the original owner. It was passed down to you from your dad. I think that's pretty cool. That's I can awesome. track that stuff. So the three cylinders, you know, three cylinders are getting upwards, you know, into the low 40s now. Then we come to the master. If you can find the running master for less than $65,000, you need to buy it. <laughs> Uh, there's a couple out there that are really, really rough. You can buy them for less, but when you look at them, you know, the engines need to be rebuilt. Hoods and fenders are in rough shape. It doesn't have the correct wheels and tires on it. Okay, it's a master. It's running. Everything else you can fix. There was one recently that the guy advertised as a 419. And in the Porsche world, I have a 418, which was a 95 millimeter system. The 419 was the 98 millimeter. They only built 50 of them, I believe it was. Okay, this guy claims to have one. So I saw the data tag. The data tag is correct. There's a tractor. It looks correct. But I asked him if he could validate the fact that it had 98 millimeter pistons. I never got an answer. So I was talking to people who were thinking about why, and I said, look, if you look at the data tag, you can see those are not, the factory never used hollow rivets. 
they use what they call drive lock rivets. Those are hollow rivets. That data plate's been off and back on. Unless I see the engine number with the born on date. Did I explain? I, I got to give you guys a lesson on born on date. Um, with the born on date and the same thing with the transmission with its born on date. I can't validate that it's a 419. Well, it didn't sell, but the bidding only got up to half of what they thought they were going to get out of it. And what were they but, thinking they were going to get? I'm just curious. The guy was hoping to get 200 and some odd thousand dollars out of Whoa. it. Whoa. Well, he claimed he had sold one recently, another one. So wait, wait a minute. The rare sent teeth, and how'd you end up with two of them? Apparently claimed he sold another one for right at $200,000. Good night. I'm not sure what it got up to, but they finally... You know, pulled the blinds open and said, "Well, the minimum bid was one hundred eighty-five thousand. Never got that high." So, what's the elusive three twelve go for? Since they're pretty rare as well. Oh, in the U.S., they could fetch up to a quarter of a million dollars. Wow! But it has to be all there. So, when I say all there, it has to have all the shrouding and this and everything else, the magnesium rims, not the steel rims, and all the parts so you can convert it if you wanted to permanently convert it from one field to another to another. All of that stuff is almost impossible to find. There's actually a website in Brazil, but there's a guy down there that has a couple for sale, and they're $75,000, $80,000, which is a pretty decent price. But you're looking at pictures, you have no idea what it looks like up underneath because nobody ever, you know, <laughs> lifts the skirts and shows you what's up underneath there. <laughs> you know, and you know as well as I do, Bondo does wonders for like six or eight months, right? 100%. So typically, if you're looking at a master, you're looking at somewhere in the seventy dollars to $125,000 range. Wow. And that's stripped. So in the case of mine, I've got the front weights, the rear weights. I've got you know all the PTOs, all the PTO covers. The three-point mechanism in the back had a bazillion pieces. I've got them all. There's a seat that goes between the fenders. Because you have to remember, back in Germany... Some people bought tractors instead of cars, so they would have a seat so they could put the family on and go to church on Sundays. Mine's got the original seat on it. Wow. You know, so all of that just starts adding and adding and adding to the features. And then I have a full dashboard. So I got the speedometer, you know, I've got all the gauges and everything on it. Now it'll work. So that drives the price up. So you mentioned a couple of times, you know, tractors in use. And so I'm wondering, are people still using these tractors for what they're intended for? Are they mostly museum pieces or collector pieces sitting in storage somewhere? Or is it kind of a mix of everything? It's a mix of everything. So I have tractors that I've done for collectors that sit inside museums and air conditioned, perfect environmental conditions. You know, that's really cool. The last two I just delivered were tractors that were used on farms that the people sent here one came from North Carolina. The other one came from Virginia for service. They hadn't been serviced in years. So I did a complete service on them. There's one gentleman that he really wanted his tractor back before the July. I'm thinking, hey, I got it. He's a farmer. Is there a crop that's got to get in or something? Does he really need it? So I heard if he got it done. No, 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 no. He wanted to put it in the 4th of July parade, <laughs> which was cool. So, I mean, he took his tractor home to North Carolina and... He sent me this awesome photo of him in the 4th of July parade. There's another one that I delivered back to its owner this past weekend. Same thing, service. He just needed it to be completely serviced. It had some lakes where it really wasn't quite running right. Took care of all of that. He has a 200-acre farm that he uses his Porsche diesel tractor on. So, yeah, I, I've got customers you know, that do all sorts of things. with them. But, yeah, there's quite a few in the U.S. that are still... This 1951 that I was telling you about, until the guy brought it here a couple of years ago, he was still using it. He had a, a mower that he was pulling behind it. He had seven or eight acres of grass that he was mowing with it. Unbelievable. I was like, dude, you got a 1951 Porsche diesel. <laughs> You've got an Elgar Porsche. It's the oldest one in the world is still running. You're doing what with it? <laughs> <laughs> The, the limited research I did prior to this for Porsche tractors, the one thing you mentioned about them having a seat on them, that was one of the biggest things that popped out to me because all the years I spent riding on a fender that was hard as could be, bouncing up and down, I would have loved to have had a pack seat to sit on while riding along on a tractor. Well, the interesting thing about the, the seats, so of course you got your driver's seat, and they had different configurations of seats you could put on top of each of the fenders. Now, when it came to the Junior, it was just this light tubular one because the fenders weren't really structurally designed for average 150, 160 pound person. 
it was really for like, you know, the kids or the grandkids, you know, to go for a ride. But two, threes, and fours, they had real seats, structural steel, wood slats that you could actually sit on and go for a ride or go to church. But the really cool thing is that one of the options that came along late was a cushion for those seats. So you could actually put cushions on the seats as you drove around on them. Very interesting. Which is kind of neat. I'll tell you, if, again, if you guys ever want to come down and drive one of these around, I'll tell you, driving a Porsche diesel tractor without a cushion, you get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> they, have no, they have no suspension. You definitely perked my interest. <laughs> sound, you said you're doing research. Take a good look at the design of the seat, the bump. Biggest bump in the world, and it's in the worst possible place. But it's, anyway, like a, it's a there. horribly designed bicycle seat. That's for sure. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, Dan, I think you have some wrap-up questions you wanted to ask uh, Sal. With your restoration work, as you were talking about the different levels of restorations and everything, I was curious about a couple of things. One is for the collectors, how are they with authenticity? Are they very picky about that? And I'm sure that those are more complete definitely are what draw the bigger numbers. But then like for your website, you claim new old stock or reproduction parts for the stuff. What sort of parts commonly go bad? Like what is one of the biggest parts that you sell? Two good questions. Let's get to the restoration thing first. If a customer sends me a tractor, asks me to find the tractor to do a restoration on, we sit down and I go through the tractor, top to bottom, front to rear. What do you want me to do to it? And I tell them, I say, you know, are you looking for a true up restoration or I'm going to go completely through the engine and rebuild it? Or are you looking for a repurposed tractor where I'm going to replace what I have to replace and leave everything alone? Do you want a wearing harness? I painstakingly go through all of this stuff, all these different pieces and parts, and I give them an estimate for what the cost is going to be. And I also estimate my labor hour. Because when it comes to parts, last October, November, the exchange rate was 105. So it was $1.05 to the euro. Today, with our economy, it's up to almost 1.25. So the price of parts has gone up 20% ever since the election. This is why I tell everybody I will estimate it for you because I have no idea what the exchange rate is going to be tomorrow. So what I encourage folks to do is that if you want me to do a restoration, let me buy the parts now. Fork over this major chunk of change now so that we've got the parts here and we're fixed on the exchange rate. It may go down, it may go the other way. You never know. You just have to hope for the best. So the killer right now is wiring harnesses because the exchange rate has gone from 105 to, like I said, you know, 125. The cost of shipping to get one here has gone up and the cost of copper has gone up. I used to be able to sell, for example, like a, a junior wiring harness for about $410, $415. That same wearing harness today is over 500. Jeez. There's somebody in the U.S. that makes them and charges a thousand dollars, so it's still cheaper. So I tell people, it's like, yeah, I don't know what the cost is going to be. Now I've got somebody that I just got done quoting a clutch kit for for his three cylinder. Today it's going to cost you right at around 1,200 dollars. The longer you wait, I have no idea where it's going to go. I sit down, ask them exactly what they're looking for, tell them the levels that I do. For example, like my tractors, anything that I can disassemble and take off of it. I have a friend of mine that runs a powder coating facility. Funny as this sounds, RAL3002 is a standard color powder coat. He takes my stuff, he blasts it, he acid as washes it, puts everything together, and I get it back powder coated. And what's nice about powder coating, my junior, I take it to shows. I really don't care if people climb on it. You're not going to hurt it. Powder coat's extremely durable, which is much better than paint. Exactly. What's really cool is to see the glow in some little boy or little girl's eyes when they know they can sit on this really, really cool tractor and have mom and dad take a picture. I mean, it just makes my day. So that's why I do that. When it comes to the restoration, I, I detail the hell out of everything. So these customers are getting exactly, I sign a document, they sign a document. They know exactly what they're going to get when time comes. You know, this is not a mass process shop. I don't do one a week. It takes me anywhere from 18 to 24 months to do a tractor. Honestly, I won't do more than one at one time. I'm going to focus on that tractor. The last one I did when it was quote unquote done, I sat back. I looked at that tractor for three weeks and kept changing stuff because it wasn't good enough for me. When I delivered it to the owner, he had other restoration experts come in and look at it and not a one of them had a single complaint about the tractor. Felt really proud about that. Yeah, yeah so what you're going to find with these tractors is the ignition switch 
is the biggest pain. And the reason why is it's just around the dashboard, it's at 45 degrees, and it's an open hole. So later on, Porsche came up with a little flip over cap. So you have to lift the cap, put the key in it. When you pull the key out, it closes it. The ignition keys, you know, aren't really a problem anymore. You know, the little glow indicator, you get dust and dirt down in there, it's not too bad. The early wiring harnesses were actually a little too undersized. So you did have a problem with wires getting hot. They have to watch for that. I tell all my customers, like, look, I'm not trying to sell you something, but you ought to replace the wearing harness and reason why. And this is, here's all your reasons. And I can send you pictures of tractors that have caught fire because of wearing harness problems. Other than that, really what you get down to is the early tractors, the valves that were designed, the materials that were designed were really substandard. So what happens after a while, you, you laugh, you know, today's valve spring pressures are real high, right? We were talking about valve spring pressures of like 25, maybe 30 pounds. That's it. But the valves, eventually, because of the heat and all of that and the material that's selected, they actually have a tendency of rounding over and getting pulled up into the head. And what happens after a while is they break and they drop down a cylinder and then you're done. I tell my customer it's actually cheaper for me to sell you a cylinder kit, which is a cylinder, the pistons, a new wrist pin and piston rings. As compared to you sending your cylinder, I have to bore it. I have to order a custom size piston and put it back together. The difference is a few dollars and you have it in a few days as compared to months. Those just seem to last forever. Of course, you know, 50, 60, 70 year old tractors, you're going to get leaks from various seals and all of that. Over the years, as I've had to replace a seal on a tractor, I've done the research and converted that European seal to a U.S. equivalent. If you call and go, hey, I need a crankshaft seal, I tell you, hey, I'll go get a, um, a CR and I give you the number and it's, it's the same damn thing. But the other thing that I've done is I've also converted them from a single lip to a double lip. They'll be good for 100 years from now. And then you mentioned telling your customers it sometimes it's easier to order the piston, wrist pin, and all of that. For any of the cylinder heads on those, do you have them re-sleeved? Is there still production of those where you can get new ones? No, cylinders, new production today. They're available. Really what I do is I just, I order a single part number and you get a new cylinder, you know, and everything that you need. And then what I do, I think you guys are familiar with this, but when you put the cylinder on, there's a critical height that you have to maintain for a diesel. So you get the right compression ratio. Well, there's a stack of shims that goes up underneath that. So what I do is I, there's four different sizes. I send my customers a complete kit. And I charge them for four shim. I said, but you know, if you don't need them, if you don't want them, send the ones back and I'll refund your money. Very nice. The shim kits are like $28. So, you know, it's like, you're going to use one. What are you going to do with the, you know, the other three? You don't need to be wasting that 17, 18, whatever it comes out to, you know. <laughs> other than doing the restores yourself and everything, do you offer parts to say someone like myself who's a DIYer that works on my own equipment and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I primarily started out the business to supply spare and repair parts. Then that transitioned into repairing cylinder heads. Because the issue with these tractors, if you run them too hot, aluminum head, it'll crack. Sometimes they'll crack by where the fuel injection port is. It's inside. It doesn't really make it, you know, it doesn't make any difference. But if you run them too long, hot, they'll crack in between the intake and exhaust valves. And if the crack goes deep enough, you'll have cross flow. I've got a process set up now with a friend of mine that runs a machine shop, heat the heads up, pop the valve seats out of them, cut it down, heliarch it, re we got a CNC machine, we recut everything, put it all back together. And what is, you can't tell it's ever been done. So I saved the heads. That's awesome. Okay, I do all of that. I do that for cut. I have four reconditioned heads sitting you know, on the shelf. So if somebody sends one in, I just take one off the shelf, you know, and ship it to them. So their tractor is not down for months at a time. It's down for just a couple of weeks. But everything and else is available for folks. If the wiring harnesses, as an example, are custom ordered. I don't keep them on the shelf because, you know, I have to know the year make and model. You know, did it come with directional lights from the factory? Did it have four-way flashers? Did it have the trailer socket on the left fender? The right fender on the outside of the fender are on the inside. Those are all significant changes to get the specific wiring harness that you need for your tractor. Wow. But getting the wire harnesses four to five woods. Very impressed with the fact that the wire harnesses are half if you order them from Europe than if the gentleman that builds them here in the U.S. That's, that's an amazing thing because yeah. normally buying it in the U.S. is cheaper. But for the people that yeah. 
You mentioned the gentleman that wanted his tractor back for 4th of July for the parade. Other than things like that, because I know recently in the past week or two, there was a Jacktown tractor show up in Bangor, PA, which is primarily for gas and steam engine tractors. But I've myself of tractor shows I've been to, I don't think I've ever seen a Porsche tractor in person. Is it a common thing to where they go out to these other shows or do Porsche tractor shows tend to have only the Porsche tractors at them? Well, there's only ever been one Porsche only tractor show and that was held Hilton Head Island, South Carolina about eight, 10 years ago. And my junior wasn't ready, but it was for Porsche tractors only. I have no idea how many showed up, but I believe it was about 50 or 60 of them. Here's the amazing thing, is that the majority of the Porsche diesel tractors are sold in Pennsylvania. So you would think that they would show up and it shows up there, but they don't. What we find out is that most of them are out in the field someplace, just got stuck over in the corn because they didn't run anymore. There's a gentleman up there right now that's got a master. He goes, are you interested in buying my master? I'm like, well, sure. Send me some pictures about how much you want for it. He goes, well, you can have it for $500. I'm like, $500. Send me pictures right away. It's just the chassis. Everything else has been taken off of it. There's no wheels. There's no tires. There's no front suspension. The engine's gone except for the block. I'm like, I can't do anything with this. It was really. And I, I said, wait a minute. I said, is this a 408? He goes, yeah. I said, oh, it's got a broken crank. He goes, yeah, how'd you know that? I'm like, I know. <laughs> but you can't do anything with it. Okay, the transmission's good. But what do I do with just the transmission, you know? I, you know, who knows if somebody ever need it. But I was just surprised that you don't see more of them in Pennsylvania since they were, you know, so popular. But going back to what you said, I took my tractor. You're going to love this story. Once a year in the area, they have a concourse de elegance for German vehicles only. So it's Porsche, BMW, Mercedes. They won't let Volkswagen in. They won't let Audi. And I have no idea why. Like, wait a minute. So I find out about this show and I submit an application. 1960 Porsche model 108. I just leave it at that. And I thought they're going to laugh me out of this thing. 10, 15 minutes later, this guy's like, hey, congratulations. We'd love to have you come and bring your Porsche. You go, da, 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 da. I show up. The guy at the gate is like, uh, sir, this isn't a tractor show. I said, no, this is the concourse, the elegance for German vehicles. Here's my application. Here's my approval to be here. He looks at me and goes, I have no idea what they're going to do with you, but just go to the top of the hill. So I drove up to the top of the hill, and the guy that ran the um, the Porsche stuff, he's like, whoa, what? Did I approve this? I said, yes, you did. He looked at me, and I went, I know. You didn't really read it, did you? He goes, no. Nah. He goes, tell you what, you unload it here, park it over there. So I loaded it and parked it. Well, he had put me way the hell out where nobody was going to be. I'm like, ah, no, nah, I'm not playing this game. So I fired the tractor up, and I roll it up to the top of the hill right at the beginning of where the um, all the Porsche cars are. And of course, a lot of attention. People loved it. And um, you know, they shut the show down. It's time for awards. And I'm going to fire the tractor up and put it on the trailer. He goes, where are you going? So I'm going to go home. He goes, no, you need to go to the award ceremony. They came with this giant plaque for the most unique Porsche in the show. <laughs> with the yeah. So I got this big, beautiful award. You know, it's see-through. So I, so you know, so I hold it, and you can you can see what it says. You see the red tractor in the background, and you know they present it to me, and everybody's. I'm really happy. Like, oh, this is really cool. I got my first award with the tractor. And as I walk away, the guy follows me, and he goes, "Don't come back." He did not let me come back. That's awesome. Uh, you know what? I got my tractor award. I don't care. <laughs> Life is there good. Yeah. I take my tractors to, you know, as many shows as I possibly, you know, when I have one. I brought my junior to a tractor show. It's called the Father's Day Car Show in Manassas. And they allow tractors. So I register. I go up there. I got there early, but really not. And people are coming by and I'm answering questions. And and there's a couple of gentlemen that are walking, you know, down the street. And they had these clipboards, which I didn't quite figure out initially. I see one of them point to my tractor and start laughing. And he's like kind of tapping his buddy, laughing at it, you know, and all of it. They're joking back and forth. And as they get closer and closer, this laughter goes away. My wife is like, what's going on? I'm like, I'm not really sure, but I'm going to meet him at the tractor site. Bright, sunshiny day, we were hiding under a tree. So I walk out and I meet him. And I said, do you have any questions? And he looks at me and goes, is this really a Porsche diesel tractor? I said, yes, sir, it is. I didn't know Porsche made tractors. So I give him the whole story. He goes, this is amazing. I didn't, you know, I didn't even know this existed. 
goes, I'll be back. And he takes off. Didn't think much of it. Another gentleman shows up who's a Porsche technician, been working for Porsche for years, and had only heard about the tractors, didn't think they actually existed. And here was one. He'd never seen one in his life. I'm like, look at it, get on it, play with it, you know, enjoy it. Well, the guy that was the clipboard, next thing I look down, he's got like 10 people following all with clipboards. Well, it ends up being the evaluation committee. And they're all looking at my tractor and they're asking questions. And can I open the hood? And what's this do? And what about this? And can you start it? I'm just having a great time with these guys. And of course I walk out with first place. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's nice to have the trophy, but just the education to teach people as to what these things are and that, you know, and Dr. Porsche actually did the tractor when the production of a tractor before he did the 356, just blows people away. Absolutely. I could not agree more. And you know, Sal, as we close out here, I want to give you an opportunity, if at all, are there any shout outs, any promotions, anything you want to tell the audience, anything coming up that we should be aware of? I'm doing my best to get the master done so I can bring it down to VIR in October. I kind of want to go down there. I actually, two years ago, I delivered a two-cylinder to one of the the race teams down there. One of the owners wanted a Porsche diesel tractor. So I brought it down to VIR and delivered it. And he was driving it around VIR while we were there. That's kind of cool. I tried to convince him that we needed to take his tow vehicle, you know, to pull the car out into the racetrack and then hook up a strap and pull it with a Porsche diesel tractor. But he's like, but that'd be a really good idea. There's only one problem. I said, yeah, I know it's too slow. He goes, yeah, exactly. And the other thing that I tell people is, yes, I run the business. Yes, I own it. But if you want to call and get technical information, it doesn't matter if you're buying parts or not for me. I don't care. I just want to see as many of these tractors up and running and people enjoying them as possible. Just reach out. If if I don't know the answer, I've got sources all over the place. I've got Roland out in Colorado, employee number one for the America Porsche Diesel Corporation. Just a great guy. What I do when it comes to parts, I give everybody the lowest possible price. And again, it, it's all based on what I have in stock and uh, what the exchange rate is. Sal, you know, I think this might not have been the episode everybody was expecting when they read the intro (laughs) paragraph. But I tell you Uh what, I think we all got an education tonight. This is a corner of the motorsport and or sports car adjacent world that now we all have a different outlook on. I mean, incredible that brands like Porsche, like Ferrari, like Lamborghini. I'm going to say the Porsche tractor truly gives new meaning to grassroots. (laughs) All that being said, Porsche Diesel USA is a full service provider of parts and support for your Porsche diesel tractor. Whether you own one or now you're thinking or considering one, for more details on Porsche Diesel, be sure to reach out to Sal at PorscheDieselUSA at gmail.com or check out www.PorscheDieselUSA.com and use the contact us there form there or just reach out to Sal directly. Like he said, he's a wealth of information. He's very well connected. And, you know, maybe further your education on these absolutely phenomenal tractors. So Sal, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. This has been awesome. Dan, I thank you for coming on and sharing your expertise in this arena. So thank you both. And and this has been awesome. Great talking to you guys. And hopefully, you know, the, the next time we have our poets thing, maybe I'll bring a tractor up to it. There you go. If you like what you've heard and want to learn more about GTM, be sure to check us out on www.gtmotorsports.org. You can also find us on Instagram at Grand Touring Motorsports. Also, if you want to get involved or have suggestions for future shows, you can call or text us at 202-630-1770 or send us an email at crewchief at gtmotorsports.org. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, everybody. Crew Chief Eric here. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Break Fix, and we wanted to remind you that GTM remains a no annual fees organization, and our goal is to continue to bring you quality episodes like this one at no charge. As a loyal listener, please consider subscribing to our Patreon for bonus and behind-the-scenes content, extra goodies, and GTM swag. For as little as $2.50 a month, you can keep our developers, writers, editors, casters, and other volunteers fed on their strict diet of Fig Newtons, gummy bears, and Monster. Consider signing up for Patreon today at www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports. And remember, without fans, supporters, and members like you, 
none of this would be possible.